So the process of turning a teenage boy into a superhuman warrior known as a space marine is kind of ridiculous. From the extensive reconditioning they have to undergo to their ludicrous levels of training. Not to mention the chapter specific trials that an aspirant will have to pass, which have ridiculously low survival rates. But in addition to this, a space marine will have to undergo an extensive amount of surgery and genetic therapy. And they'll end up receiving 19 new implants that have a wide range of crazy effects. Now some of these are things that you'd expect a superhuman to have, such as a few hormonal implants that cause their skeletal and muscle systems to grow to ridiculous levels, to a whole bunch of weird ones like a gland that lets them spit acid, or another that lets the Astartes learn all of their enemies secrets by consuming their flesh. The Space Marines are so much more powerful than a normal human that most consider them to be a completely separate species now, although the more common term used for them is transhuman, in that they were born normal human boys, but have transitioned into super hunky shredded nine foot tall demigod men. So today we're going to learn about those 19 implants that make a Space Marine a Space Marine. But first a quick message from this week's sponsor and then we're going to dive headfirst into the grimdark. Stay tuned. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. I don't know about you, but I'm obsessed with opening boxes. I love that feeling of not knowing what's inside, but then pulling something awesome. And it doesn't even have to be a box. It could be cool PvP rewards, boss drops, or just unlocking cool new characters, weapons, and armor. It's probably why I was so obsessed with trading card games when I was a kid, and played a frankly irresponsible amount of online MMOs. And Raid has tons of rewards like this, with over 600 champions to collect and upgrade, endless artifacts to find, and billions of different teams to try out and not to mention tons of those boxes I love. Let's open a couple of them now. Personally, I don't really care about a character's stats. I get excited if they look cool. And this Painsmith in particular blew me away. I know a Chaos Dwarf when I see one, and they've always been my favorite faction in other franchises. And there's a ton happening in Raid this month. They've got special events every single day, including an entirely new event for the Summer Solstice. It's called Path of Light, and you'll be able to explore three different branching paths, each with their own unique rewards. On top of that, there's some awesome new champions coming out, and an awesome set of skins for the amazing Trunda Guilt Mallet. And Raid's also currently running their special Deliana Chase event, where you can unlock the amazing Deliana, a new legendary champion for the High Elves faction. And all you have to do to unlock her is log in and play Raid for seven days, between now and July 20th. And that's it, you'll get Deliana for free. This is the best time to get started in Raid. And if you click on my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen, you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking about the free epic champion Aina, 200k silver, one energy refill, one XP boost, and one ancient shard. So you can summon some awesome champions as soon as you get into the game. All of this treasure will be waiting for you right here. And the gifts keep on coming for new players. Once you're in the game, enter the promo code MYDELIANA to get your hands on everything. You'll get 50 XP brews to instantly get your legendary hero Deliana to max level, as well as a ton of extra silver. Thanks a ton to my friends over at Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video, and let's get into the grimdark. Now before we dive into all of the Space Marines implants, I feel there's a few things we have to clarify about where Space Marines actually come from. You see, the Astartes are taken as recruits when they are young children, sometimes as young as six years old. However, there are some chapters that don't necessarily follow this, most famously with the Space Wolves, who wait for their recruits to be considerably older, normally in their late teenage years. Adults being turned into Space Marines is insanely rare. To be fair, it has happened in the past, as the Jarls of Fenris, the men who fought side by side with Lehman Russ before he was known to be a Primarch, all volunteered to become Space Marines and continue fighting by his side. He warned them that the process would most likely kill them, but their loyalty to their king was so strong that they refused to stray from their path. We aren't really given concrete numbers here, but we know that the vast majority of them died. It's said that only a handful of them were successfully made into Astartes and would later be known as the Greybeards within their legion. There are also examples of what some people refer to as Half Marines like Luther of the Dark Angels or Corferon of the Wordbearers, who were considerably older when they became Marines and unfortunately weren't able to receive all of the implants. Now, the process for the implementation of all of these new organs begins when a Space Marine is around 10 years old and concludes by the time they're either 18 or 19. They're done in a certain order as many of them require the effects generated by previous implants in order to be implemented successfully. The surgeries required to put these new organs inside of a Space Marine are incredibly painful and invasive. And the worst part is, many of them are neurological in nature and thus require the acolyte to be awake for the entire surgery with no painkillers, as the surgeon may require constant feedback and communication from the aspirant in order for a successful implementation. Now, I've never had brain surgery personally, but I've been told that this is not actually that uncommon of an experience in the real world. And although this sounds pretty brutal, it pales in comparison to what the aspirant will have to face 
once they become a full-blown space marine. And you've probably heard the term gene seed used in reference to the space marines, but what exactly is it? Gene seed isn't just a single thing. It's basically everything that's used to make all of the space marines implants, and also the implants themselves. It's a mix of genetic material and micro robots. Quite literally, it's a catch-all term used for all of the Space Marines' new organs, along with just about every organic and synthetic component used in their creation. You may be aware that an apothecary's main job on the battlefield is to quote-unquote harvest the gene seed from dead Space Marines in order to be used to create these implants that will be placed in a new recruit. What the apothecary is actually harvesting is what is known as a progenoid gland, which we'll get into later in the video. So yes, they are technically harvesting gene seed, but everything is gene seed. The vast majority of the time when you hear this term used, it's in reference to the genetic material stored within the progenoid gland. But other times you'll hear it in reference to many other things, which tends to confuse new people. So I felt I should clarify this. Now when space marines are compared to the other superhuman warriors of the Imperium, known as the Custodes, the two factions are remarkably similar in structure and function. However, the major difference between them, other than their cultures and histories, is that everything that makes a custodian a custodian is grown within them at the genetic level. Whereas with the Space Marines, it is produced artificially and then implanted inside of them. With all of that in mind, let's dive into what makes an Astartes an Astartes, and take a deeper look at the 19 different implants that they'll receive during their training. Oh yeah, and fair warning, if you're the type of person who gets offended when somebody mispronounces made-up fantasy words, then you better strap in because I'm about to absolutely butcher the names of all of these organs. Number 1. The Second Heart Now this one is pretty self-explanatory, and it's the very first implant that a Space Marine receives. The secondary heart is not as large as the original, but it is still nonetheless connected directly into their entire circulatory system. This cranks up their blood pressure and speeds up the process in which blood flows throughout their body. This allows more oxygen and nutrients to be delivered directly to the Space Marine's muscles. To further explain why this is important, here is a quick science lesson from someone who doesn't know anything about biology. And most of my knowledge comes from bro science. You see, when you breathe, your body takes in oxygen, which upon entering your lungs, then enters your bloodstream. Once your blood is oxygenated, your red blood cells will carry that oxygen throughout the body to the muscles, where that oxygen is then used to break down glucose into ATP, which your muscles will use as fuel. You're doing this all the time, but when you exercise, you end up breathing a lot heavier and faster, and your heart rate increases. This is because your muscles are put under an enormous amount of strain, and need more of that fuel to get through whatever high-intensity activity you're participating in. And I don't know about you, but I know after 40 minutes on a treadmill, I am personally dying, breathing crazy heavy. I'm definitely out of shape, I weigh like 220 pounds, and although I consider myself pretty strong, the majority of that is definitely not muscle. Space Marines are estimated to be around 705 pounds of muscle out of their armor. So needless to say, there's some thick ass boys with way more muscle mass than any normal human and those muscles are hungry for oxygen. This combined with the ninth implant, which is a mechanical third lung, makes sure the Space Marines muscles have ample supplies of fuel while they are in combat. Oh yeah, and if their primary heart is ever damaged in combat, the secondary one can take over and keep them alive. It's all in all super useful for a seven to nine foot tall killing machine to have. Number two, the Osmodula, also known as the Iron Heart the osmodula secretes a form of accelerated human growth hormone. This combined with the third implant that we'll talk about in a little bit, is what turns a scrawny teenager into an absolutely jacked super soldier. This is a tiny implant placed next to the pituitary gland at the base of a space marine's brain, and is then hooked into the space marine's endocrine system. After the implementation is complete, the acolyte is placed on a diet of food laced with ceramic-based minerals. The combination of the hormones and these minerals creates a rapid growth in the Space Marine's skeletal muscular system. And if you didn't know, because I definitely didn't and was confused and had to look it up, the skeletal muscular system includes all of your tendons, ligaments, cartilage, and connective tissues that basically form the framework throughout your body that support your muscles. In this way, the osmodula helps generate the groundwork upon which the massive muscles generated by the third implant will rest. The process takes about two years to complete, after which the Space Marine will have grown pretty rapidly, some estimates putting them between seven and eight feet tall. But there are reports of Space Marines being larger than this. The most interesting thing is that the bones of the ribcage actually fuse into one solid plate. And this fused ribcage is so dense and hard that it's actually like always wearing a bulletproof vest. It offers an enormous amount of protection to the Space Marine's vital organs, but probably makes bending over pretty difficult. Not to mention it's an enormous pain in the ass when the Space Marine has been wounded and the apothecaries need to get inside of his chest cavity in order to operate. Number three, the Biscopia. The Biscopia is also known as the Forge of Strength. 
It is implemented around the same time as the first two implants and works in tandem with the Osmodula. It is a small hormonal-based organ placed inside of the Space Marine's chest. The hormones it secretes cause rapid muscle growth throughout the aspirant's body and lead to an enormous increase in physical strength and endurance. Number four, the hemostamen. For reasons that will become immediately apparent, the hemostamen is nicknamed the blood maker. It is placed into one of the Space Marine's main blood vessels, such as the aorta, and alters the biochemical composition of an Astartes red blood cells. The influence of this organ on those blood cells greatly increases their capacity for carrying vital nutrients and oxygen to all of the Space Marine's muscles. Fun fact, an Astartes blood is said to be vastly more vibrant shade of red than a normal human's due to its enhanced oxygen carrying capacity. The hemostamen, along with the three organs mentioned previously, work in tandem to make a Space Marine into a monstrous individual. Number five, Laramin's organ. The Laramin's organ is nicknamed the Healer and is definitely my favorite of all of the Space Marine implants. And listen, I know you may say it's weird to have a favorite organ, but here we are. This thing is a tiny implant in the shape of a human liver, but it's roughly the size of a ping pong ball. It's placed within the chest of a Space Marine and its entire purpose is to produce a new type of cell known as a Laramin cell, named after the genetic researcher that created it. This thing's primary purpose is to cause blood clotting at an impact site of a wound. The cells generated by the organ work almost identically to how platelets in our own bodies work, causing our blood to bind together in order to stem the bleeding when we get hurt. If it wasn't for these platelets, the tiniest little cut could cause us to bleed out. Laramin cells are like platelets on steroids. When trauma is detected, the organ immediately releases Laramin cells into the Space Marine's bloodstream, and they travel to the impact site in less than a second. Once there, the Laramin cells begin the process of clotting, and these cells are so good at what they do that they can create a massive amount of scar tissue in seconds, meaning that an Astarte could have a limb severed completely and there would be no need for a tourniquet, as his own body can create an organic one, stemming the blood flow incredibly quickly, no matter how grievous their injury. Number six, the catalepsian node, nicknamed the unsleeping. Of all of the shiny new organs a space marine receives, this is gonna be the one that I want the most. It's a tiny thing that is placed just above their brainstem and allows them to go without sleep for enormous amounts of time. You see, when an Astartes is sleep deprived, this thing can detect the elevated levels of stress hormones present in their body. When this happens, the space marine can tap into the node and selectively shut down certain portions of their brain allowing it to rest while the rest of the brain remains active. This is remarkably similar to what species of sharks and dolphins do. In the Black Legion novel, the main character Cao Yun, former sorcerer of the Thousand Suns, is now serving within the Black Legion. At one point he states, sleep is rarely a concern for the warriors of the Legion Astartes. We are able to subsist on mere hours of such healing rest each week, and we are capable of long periods without it entirely, albeit with a strain upon our physiologies. In the previous novel, Talon of Horus, the same member of the Thousand Sons is plagued by nightmares of wolves, at one point causing him to stay awake for 13 days straight. He finally passes out from exhaustion before the nightmares inevitably wake him up once more. He did manage to get three hours of sleep at that point and said that it was the best three hours of his life. Supposedly, the longest a space marine was able to stay awake was when a squad of Crimson Fist managed to stay awake for 328 hours fighting off orcs. Number seven is the Preomnor, also known as the Neutralizer. This is another organ that seems pretty straightforward at first, but is incredibly useful. It's basically a second stomach, spliced into the Astartes digestive system. This creation filters out toxic, poisonous, or even just non-digestible elements from anything a space marine consumes. The machine houses an enormous database of all known toxic elements and is able to detect them in real time, whether this be a known form of poison or if it just detects certain levels of things that are definitely not good for the Space Marine. These toxic elements are then removed from whatever the Space Marine ate and are either destroyed or stored in a chamber within the device. The Astartes can then spit them back up to remove them completely or sometimes, depending on what it was, the toxic components may be rerouted to another organ known as the Betcher's gland for reasons that will become immediately apparent when we get to it. Number eight is the Omniphagia, nicknamed the Remembrancer. This is definitely one of the strangest organs a Space Marine will receive, and its nickname actually derives from the human mortals that were sent along during the Grand Crusade to document the Space Marine's accomplishments for future generations. It basically connects the Space Marine's brain and stomach together through a series of specially designed nerve bundles. This allows the stomach to gain valuable information from anything the Space Marine eats. This includes DNA, RNA, protein sequences, and pretty much anything related to experience or memory. Through this process, an Astartes can learn an enormous amount of information about whatever he ate. If he eats an animal, for example, the Space Marine can discern everything about the creature 
from its last meal, how it was killed, the environment it lives in, its age, physical health, and most things about its last few weeks of life. If the space marine consumes the flesh of a sentient creature, the information gathered by the organ can, for lack of better words, allow them to see their memories. In the novels, this often takes the form of a literal vision, but I believe in reality, it's more of a vision through data kind of situation. Regardless of how it's interpreted, the Omniphagia gives access to an enormous amount of tactical information about the Space Marines' enemies. See, don't think you can hide anything from the Space Marines. They know that you keep all of your secrets in your flesh. Delicious, delicious secrets. Number nine is the Multilung. This one's pretty straightforward as well. It's a third lung that is hooked into an Astartes alongside his other two. Its primary purpose is to allow the Space Marine to absorb oxygen, even in environments that are either incredibly low in oxygen or super toxic. The multi-lung is able to filter out these toxic components from the air and absorb only the oxygen. In particularly dangerous environments, the Astartes can switch to using the third lung exclusively. You can think of it as like a built-in gas mask inside of their chest. Now, it also serves the dual purpose of allowing the Space Marine to absorb much more oxygen from the air than he could if it was just with his normal set of lungs, thus playing an important role in producing more oxygenated blood to power his enormous muscle mass. The 10th implant is known as the Oculobe, also known by its far more badass nickname, the Eye of Vengeance. The Oculobe is implanted in the Space Marine's brain and hooked up to his octave nerves connected to the retina. The stimuli produced by the Eye of Vengeance allows the Space Marine Apothecary to make adjustments to the growth patterns of a Space Marine's eyes, more specifically, to how his retinas receive and interpret light. As the Marine grows, his vision will be vastly superior to that of any normal human, allowing them to see not only in low light nearly perfectly, but they have the ability to see in the dark far better than you or I. It's not perfect though, they still do utilize night vision in their helmets. But by all accounts, they probably have like 20-40 vision, or 40-20. I'm not really sure what the numbers mean, they have very good vision. Number 11, the Lyman's ear. Considering that this implant has the word ear in it, you could probably guess what it's all about. But obvious or not, it's still incredibly important. The implant reorganizes the structure of a space marine's inner ear, which not only increases his hearing to superhuman levels, giving him the ability to filter out different sounds or frequencies and greatly enhancing others, but it also has the added benefit of making him completely immune to dizziness, motion sickness, and vertigo. Number 12, the Sasson Membrane, nicknamed the Hibernator. Okay, so this one is definitely cool and certainly practical in the grim darkness of the far future, but it's also one that a space marine hopes they'll never have to use. You see, the Sasson membrane is an organ that is implemented into an Astartes brain, and upon activation, the Marine can actively place himself in a coma. It's more of a form of suspended animation, though, that slows down all of the functions needed for life, keeping him alive even if he sustains an absolutely lethal mortal wound, such as tanking a LAS cannon shot directly to the chest. This is an absolutely last-ditch effort to save the Marine's life, as it renders him completely helpless and leaves him vulnerable to a coup de grace from the enemy. If his chapter's apothecaries can get to him before this happens and get him back to their medical facilities, the Space Marine may just live on to fight another day, or at the very least, be given the option for dreadnought entombment. Unlike a lot of the other implants, whose use is not that difficult for a Space Marine to master, it is said that the Sasson membrane takes years of training in chemical therapy to even be able to activate it, let alone have the ability to unconsciously turn it on if the Space Marine falls unconscious or loses control of their body. And a space marine can't just wake up from this thing on his own. It takes chemical therapy or an auto-hypnotic suggestion from an apothecary in order to wake them. Even with that, there's no guarantee they'll be able to come out of it. The longest documented use of the membrane was by a space marine named Silas, who stayed in suspended animation for 567 days before being revived. Number 13, the melanochrome. Nicknamed the skin shield, Okay, a lot of people on TikTok got mad at me when I talked about this one, and don't get me wrong, I get it, but I personally think it's really cool. The implant allows a space marine to unconsciously control the pigmentation of their skin by generating or reducing the amount of melanin in their body. When exposed to extreme sunlight on worlds with particularly violent suns, the Astartes skin will darken to compensate and protect him. The pigmentation varies based upon the level of radiation that the implant detects. The salamanders are famous for having a defect with this particular implant that, due to an interaction with their homeworld of Nocturne Sun, and be constantly putting out its maximum capacity. This has caused the salamanders to all have pitch black skin and red eyes, no matter their racial background. Number 14, the Olytic Kidney, nicknamed the Purifier. It is able to filter out toxic components inside of the Astartes' body, 
not just from whatever he eats, but through any possible way toxins may enter his bloodstream. Whether this be because the Space Marine breathed them in and they overloaded the third lung, he ate them and they were too much for the second stomach to handle, or more commonly, the toxins entered the Space Marine's body through some form of injection method, such as the many toxic weapons of the Tyranids, namely those that fire living ammunition that burrow into their target. There's one major drawback, however. If the olytic kidney needs to be used, it causes the space brain to fall unconscious. So in a similar fashion to the Sussan membrane, it's absolutely a last resort. If the Marine is in the middle of combat and goes unconscious, they'll be left completely vulnerable until the kidney is able to finish removing the poison from their body. Number 15, the Neuroglottis, nicknamed the Devourer. This thing enormously enhances the sense of smell and taste of a space marine. When the Astartes smells or puts something in their mouth, the implant allows them to basically detect every particular type of molecule in it. This lets them detect any trace amounts of poison, learn the thing's chemical makeup, as well as gaining valuable insight into the odor or object's history. This further enhances their tracking ability by giving them properties similar to a canine. And although this sounds cool, I've been told you don't want to know how the sausage is made, so I think this would completely ruin all food for me. The 16th implant is known as the Mucronoid, and it's nicknamed the Weaver. You see, the Weaver is pretty gross, but it serves a valuable purpose. The gland secretes a waxy substance with the same consistency as snot through the Space Marine's pores. It is usually used before a Space Marine enters suspended animation, but it apparently can be used in a lot of other extreme environments as well, offering an extra layer of protection against dangerously high or low temperatures. There's even some evidence to suggest that its secretions can help protect the Space Marine from the vacuum of space. Number 17 is the Betcher's Gland, nicknamed the Poison Bite. Now this is one that always confuses people who are brand new to 40k. The Betcher's Gland is actually a pair of glands placed inside of a Space Marine's mouth. When activated, the gland can turn the Space Marine's spit into a corrosive acid-like substance. This has a variety of different uses, from being used as a backup weapon to be spit at and blind or even straight up dissolve the face of their enemy. Or it could even be used to melt through chains if the Space Marine finds himself captured and bound. The chemicals created by the Betcher's gland can also be used to aid in the Space Marine's digestion if he chooses to consume something that would be indigestible by normal humans. The 18th implant is known as the progenoid glands, nicknamed gene seed. And again, as I clarified in the beginning of this video, all of these things are technically gene seed, but this is what most people refer to when they're talking about gene seed. The progenoid glands may not seem that special at first, but the reality is they are the most important organ a space marine will get. They are a pair of two different glands, one placed in the Astartes neck and the other in his chest. While they are maturing inside of the space marine's body, the glands collect and store germ cells based on the DNA of all of the other implants inside of the marine. This genetic material can then be used by the apothecaries of their space marine chapter to cultivate all of the other implants in a different marine. In fact, all of the implants inside of the original space marine's body came from the progenoid gland of one of his brothers. Space Marines are infertile, so this is the closest they get to actually reproducing. The ability to make gene seed from scratch was unfortunately lost a long time ago, and the harvesting of progenoid glands is the only way of producing new gene seed. Through this, the chapter can live on through its new recruits. Now, many chapters have a bank of gene seed either derived in this way or left over from the time of the Grand Crusade, and most chapters end up paying a tithe of around 5% of the gene seed they produce to the Mechanicus, who sits on a massive reserve of gene seed from all of the known chapters to be used in emergency situations. The progenoid gland in the Space Marine's neck is considered to be fully developed around two years after its implementation, and can be harvested from the Marine through a standard procedure with no ill effects. However, the one placed inside of his chest takes considerably longer to mature, normally finishing its development around after a decade. And this one in particular is really difficult to get at without extensive surgeries, and is normally only harvested after the Space Marine dies. This harvesting is one of the primary roles of the medical marines known as apothecaries, who collect these implants from their deceased brothers on the battlefield. Some like to think that in this way, the marine that gave his life can live on through a new recruit. A single progenoid gland is enough to create all of the needed implants to turn a new recruit into a space marine, meaning that in a perfect world, one space marine can produce two more. Due to the nature of the wars the space marines are deployed into, the overwhelming majority of space marine remains cannot be retrieved for one reason or another. Other, meaning every progenoid gland that is harvested is absolutely vital to the chapter's continued existence. The 19th implant, the Black Carapace, nicknamed the Interface. So the Black Carapace is what allows a Space Marine to link more directly with his power armor and unlock its full potential. And unlike all of the other organs, 
This one can be built from scratch and doesn't necessarily require gene seed to create. Now, there are a lot of different people throughout the Imperium that use power armor, notably the Sisters of Battle or some Inquisitors. However, because they do not have such a direct link to the system's machine spirit like the Space Marines do, they are not able to utilize its full potential, and thus it provides them less protection and maneuverability. The Black Carapace is like a sheet of dark organic fibrous material that is surgically placed in and around the Space Marine's torso, just beneath the skin. After implementation, a trained apothecary will make several incisions in the carapace that will be used as entry ports to connect the Space Marine's nervous system directly to the systems of its power armor. A few hours after this process is complete, the fibrous material begins to harden, and its synthetic fibers will begin to grow inwards, connecting with the Space Marine's nervous system. This basically means that the carapace acts like a link between the Space Marine and his armor. The armor plugs into the carapace, which is plugged into the Marine's nervous system. In this way, the Astartes power armor becomes an extension of his own body. Whereas with a normal human who uses power armor, they're basically wearing a big clunky suit. The added hardening of the carapace also offers an additional layer of protection for the Space Marine. But that's not really its primary purpose. Its main job is to link the Marine to his armor or even to the various vehicles that they may employ, such as a Rhino or a Land Raider. With the introduction of the Primaris Marines, there are actually three new implants that they receive to further distinguish them from their firstborn brothers. The first of which is known as the Sinew Coils, nicknamed the Steel Within, and they're like a layer of synthetic muscle that work in tandem with his superhuman muscle system to further enhance the Primaris Marine's strength. They are duro-metallic cables that can contract with enormous amounts of force. They're incredibly durable, and being filled with a whole bunch of metal cables consequently increases the Space Marine's resistance to damage. It is said that an unarmored Primaris Marine can easily crush a man's skull with his bare hands. And in making this video, I scoured through a whole bunch of different texts, trying to find a direct quote on the average strength of a Primaris Marine without the aid of their power armor. And unfortunately, I came up empty-handed. It's something that's left intentionally vague, but we're gonna do some quick maths here. A healthy adult male's average grip strength is around 72.6 pounds. Well, the Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics stated that around 520 pounds of pressure would be needed to crush a skull. This would place the unarmored Marine at about seven times stronger than the average man. However, the quote says that it can be done with ease, as in crushing a skull doesn't even require that much of their power, so it's likely that they're far stronger. And again, this is without utilizing their armor. If you know of a source that directly explains how strong an unarmored Marine or Primaris Marine is, let me know in the comments. I learn more about 40K from you guys than pretty much any other source. The second of the three Primaris-specific implants is known as the Magnificat, nicknamed the Amplifier. It is a small hormonal implant that works similar to the first three implants a Space Marine gets, namely the Biscopia and the Osmodula, which ramp up the production of growth hormones to levels even further than that of the firstborns. With a larger and stronger skeleton and musculatory system, the Primaris Marines often stand about a foot and a half taller than regular Marines, and are considerably heavier. What's interesting about the Magnificant is that when Belisarius Call created it, he used the Emperor's designs for a gland that was nicknamed the Godmaker. This was something that was only implemented in the Primarchs. Now, Paul tried to recreate the device, but most of the notes on its production and function were missing, and thus he was only able to replicate half of it. Whether it was the Emperor himself that destroyed his research or somebody else, we're not really sure. Now, if Call had been successful, this would have made all of the Primaris Marines into mini Primarchs. And finally, we have the Belisarian Furnace, nicknamed the Revitalizer. This thing is kind of ridiculous, and it's another one of those last resort type of implants. You see, if the Primaris Marine receives absolutely catastrophic damage that would surely end his life, then the organ can kick into high gear and release a tidal wave of synthesized chemicals. These chemicals cause the Primaris Marine's body to rapidly regrow tissue, bone, and muscle. It's a desperate last attempt to keep him alive, and more importantly, fighting. Unfortunately, the furnace has a considerably long recharge time, and after it is used, it will not be able to be utilized again for a very long time. And those are all of the implants a Space Marine receives that makes them better than you or I. But that's only half of what makes a Space Marine a Space Marine. They also have considerable training, vast armories, and centuries of combat experience that make them into absolutely insane superhuman warriors. But what do you guys think? If you could pick one of these implants to be grafted into your body, which one would it be? Would you want to be able to spit acid, or would you like that gland that makes you swole? Being able to basically fall off a skyscraper and have my body stitch itself back together sounds pretty dope, but I'm not gonna lie, the thing that makes it so I don't have to sleep anymore would be pretty cool. I would get so many more videos out. Anyways, thanks for taking the time to hang out with me, you guys, and until next time, happy wargaming.